When Christ said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is a call to a life of theosis. Personal communion with God. The Son of God became man so that man can become a God by grace. To the Western mind, this idea of becoming a God may seem incomprehensible, sacrilegious even, but it derives unquestionably from Christ's teachings. These same teachings have been preserved in the Eastern Orthodox Church for the past 2,000 years. The following video was written by Archmandrite George, an abbot of a monastery on Mount Athos. It explains this concept, how we can become perfect, just as our Father in Heaven is perfect. The first Adam separated us from God with his disobedience and his egotism. With his love and his obedience to the Father, obedience unto death, the second Adam, Christ, brings us back once more to God. Once again, he orients our freedom towards God so that by offering him our freedom, we unite with him. The work of the new Adam presupposes the work of the new Eve, the Panagia, who put right the wrong done by the old Eve. Eve drove Adam to disobedience. The new Eve, the Panagia, contributes to the incarnation of the new Adam, who will guide the human race towards obedience to God. Therefore, as the first human person who achieved theosis in an exceptional and, of course, unrepeatable way, the Theotokos played a role in our salvation which was not only fundamental, but both necessary and irreplaceable. If the Panagia, in her obedience, had not offered her freedom to God, had she not said yes to God, God would not have been able to incarnate. Once God had given freedom to man, he would not have been able to violate his gift. So he would not have been able to incarnate if there had not been such a pure, all-holy psyche as the Theotokos, who would offer her freedom, her will, all of herself totally to God so as to draw him towards herself and towards us. We owe so much to Panagia. This is why our church honors and venerates the Theotokos so much. So much so that St. Gregory Palamas, summarizing patristic theology, says, that our Panagia holds the second place after the Holy Trinity. That she is God with a little g, after God with an uppercase g. She is the boundary between the created and the uncreated. She leads those being saved.
here on the holy mountain. A contemporary saint, Nicodemus, lived. And he pointed out that the angelic ranks themselves are illumined by the light they receive from the Panagia. Therefore, she is praised by our church as more honorable than the cherubim and incomparably more glorious than the seraphim. The incarnation of the Logos and the theosis of man are the great mystery of our faith and theology. Our Orthodox Church lives this every day with its mysteries, with its hymns, with its icons, with its whole life. Even the architecture of an Orthodox Church witnesses to this. The great dome of the churches symbolizes the descent of heaven to earth. The evangelist St. John writes that God became man and dwelt among us. We represent the Theotokos in the apse of the altar to show that God comes to earth and to men through her. She who contained the uncontainable God within herself for our salvation. To continue, our churches show deified men, those who became gods by grace because God became man. sainted and deified man. Thus, when we enter an Orthodox Church and see the beautiful holy icons, this is an immediate experience through which we learn what God's plan is for man, the purpose of our life, the incarnation of God and the theosis of man. Those who wish to unite with Christ and through Christ with God the Father recognize that this union is realized in the body of Christ, which is our holy Orthodox Church. Of course, this union is not with the divine essence, but with the deified human nature of Christ. But this union with Christ is not external nor is it simply moral. We are not followers of Christ in the way that one might perhaps follow a philosopher or a teacher. We are members of Christ's body. The church is the body of Christ, the real body, not a moral one, as some mistaken theologians have written, not having looked deeply enough into the spirit of the Holy Church. Despite our unworthiness and sinfulness, Christ takes us Christians and incorporates us into his body. He makes us members of himself. We become real members of Christ, not just followers of a code of morality. As the Apostle Paul puts it, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Certainly, depending on the spiritual state of Christians, they are sometimes living members of Christ's body, and other times they are dead. But even as dead members, 
we still do not cease to be members of Christ's body. For example, someone who is baptized has become a member of Christ's body. If he does not confess, does not take communion, does not live a spiritual life, he is a dead member of Christ's body. But when he repents, he immediately receives divine life. This permeates him and he becomes a living member of Christ's body again. Someone like this does not need to be rebaptized. Someone who has never been baptized, however, is not a member of Christ's body. Even if, according to human standards, he lives a moral life. In order to be incorporated into Christ, he needs to be baptized. Since we are members of Christ's body, Christ's life is offered to us and becomes our life. So we are enlivened, saved, and deified, yet we could not be deified if Christ did not make us members of his holy body. We cannot be saved if the holy mysteries of the church did not exist. These make us one body with Christ and, as according to the church fathers, we share the same body and the same blood as Christ. We are in fact one body and one blood with Christ. St. John Chrysostom, the fifth century saint, says that God has nothing more to give man than what he gives him in Holy Communion. Man cannot ask anything more of God than what he receives from Christ in Holy Communion. So, being baptized, chrismated, confessing, we commune through the body and blood of the Lord, and we, too, become gods by grace. We unite with God. We are no longer strangers, for we have become familiar with God. Inside the church in which we unite with God, we live this new reality which Christ brought to the world, the new creation. This is the life of the church, of Christ, which becomes ours as a gift from the Holy Spirit. Everything in the church leads to theosis, the holy liturgy, the mysteries, divine worship, the gospel sermon, the fasting, all of these lead to this one thing. The church alone is the place of theosis. The church is not a social, cultural, or historical organization and does not resemble other organizations in the world. The world has fine institutions, fine organizations, fine establishments, and other fine things, but our Orthodox Church is the unrepeatable, the sole place for the communion of God with man, for the theosis of man. Only within the church can man become a god, and nowhere else. Not in universities, not in social services, not in any of the fine and good things that the world has. None of these are able to offer what the church offers, however good they may be. It is possible that we weak and sinful men go through crises and difficulties from time to time within the church. All of these happen in the church because we are as yet on the way to theosis. And it is very natural that human weaknesses still exist. We are becoming gods, but not yet. So no matter how often these things occur, we will not leave the church. 
because within the church, we have the possibility, we have the only possibility to unite with God. For example, when we go to church to attend the service, we may meet people there who do not pay attention to the holy service. Then along comes a seemingly reasonable thought which says, what do you gain by coming to church? Might it not be better to sit at home, pray, in greater peace and comfort? However, we must contradict this evil thought with discretion. Yes, perhaps I'll have more outward peace at home, but I will not have God's grace to deify and sanctify me. I will not have Christ who is present in his church. I will not have his holy body and his precious blood, which are on the holy altar in his holy church. I will not partake in the Last Supper of the Holy Liturgy. I will be cut off from my fellow brethren in Christ, together with whom we form Christ's body. So whatever may happen, we will not leave the church, because only within it do we find the path to theosis. According to the teachings of the Holy Bible and the Fathers of the Church, man is able to achieve theosis because within the Orthodox Church of Christ, the grace of God is uncreated. God is not only essence, as the West thinks. He is also energy. If God was only essence, we could not unite with him, could not commune with him, because the essence of God is awesome, unapproachable for man. As was written, never will man see my face and live. So here's a relevant example from things human. If we grasp a bare electric wire, we will die. However, if we connect a lamp to the same wire, illumination, we see, enjoy, and are assisted by the energy of the electric current, but we are not able to grasp its essence. Let's say that something similar happens with the uncreated energy of God. If we were able to unite with the essence of God, we would become gods in essence. Then everything would become a god, and there would be confusion so that essentially nothing would be a god. This is what they believe in the Oriental religions, in Hinduism, where the god is not a personal existence, but an indistinct power dispersed through all the world in men, in animals, and in objects. If God had only the divine essence of which we cannot partake and did not have his energies, he would remain a self-sufficient God, closed within himself and unable to communicate with his creatures. God, according to the orthodox theological view, is one in a trinity and a trinity in one. As the Holy Fathers repeatedly say, God is filled with a divine eros, a divine love for his creatures. Because of this infinite and ecstatic love of his, he comes out of himself and seeks to unite with them. This is expressed and realized as his energy, or better said, his energies. With these, God created the world and continues to preserve it. He gives essence and substance to our world 
through his essence creating energies. He is present in nature and preserves the universe with his preserving energies. He illuminates man with his illuminating energies. He sanctifies him with his sanctifying energies. Finally, he deifies him with his deifying energies. Thus, through his uncreated energies, Holy God enters nature, the world, history, and human life. The energies of God are divine energies. They too are God, but without being his essence. They are God, and therefore they can deify man. If the energies of God were not divine and uncreated, they would not be God, and so they would be unable to deify us, to unite us with God. There would be an unbridgeable distance between God and man. But as God has the divine energies and unites with us by these energies, we are able to commune with him and to unite with his grace without becoming identical with God, as would happen if we were united through his essence. So, we unite with God through his uncreated energies and not through his essence. This is the mystery of our orthodox faith and life. Western heretics cannot accept this. Being rationalists, they do not discern between the essence and the energy of God. So they say that they cannot speak about man's theosis because God is only essence. For on this basis, how can man be deified when they do not accept that the divine energies are uncreated, but regard them as created? How can something created deify man? How can something outside of God deify man? What then, according to them, remains as the purpose of human life? Simply moral improvement. If man cannot be deified with divine grace and divine energies, what purpose does his life have? Only that he becomes morally better. But moral perfection is not enough for man. It is not enough for us simply to become better than before, simply to perform moral deeds. We have as our final aim to unite with Holy God himself. This is the purpose of the creation of the universe. This is what we desire. This is our joy, our happiness, and our fulfillment. The psyche of man, who is created in the image and likeness of God, yearns for God and desires union with him. No matter how moral, how good man may be, if he does not find God, if he does not unite with him, he finds no rest. For holy God placed within him this holy thirst, the divine eros, the desire for union with him, for theosis. So he has in himself the power which he receives from his creator in order to love truly, strongly, selflessly, just as his holy creator falls in love with his world, with his creatures. This is so that with his holy impetus and loving power, he falls in love with God. If man did not have the image of God in himself, he would not be able to seek its prototype. Each of us is an image of God, and God is our prototype. The image seeks the prototype, and only when it finds it does it find rest. Thus concludes chapters 3, 4, and 5 
on the full teaching of theosis found in orthodoxy. You can watch and read the rest of the chapters in the link below. I, Tobit, have walked all the days of my life in the ways of truth and justice. But all the tribes revolted, sacrificed to the heifer, Baal. Fear not, for she is appointed to you from the beginning, and you shall preserve her, and she shall go with you. Blessed be God, praise him, magnify him.